Divine Truth Assistance Group. These group assistance sessions are about putting principles of divine truth into action. This discussion is part of the 2014 Australia Group 2 series. Jesus presents forgiveness and repentance concepts. Filmed on the 3rd of August 2014 in Monterey, New South Wales, Australia. This is part one. The first thing we need to do is uh, tell you how many of you will be with us tomorrow. Is that okay? Um, and if I could just mention, before I do that, mention to the people who we feel will benefit from this talk who didn't have a strong desire to love. So that was yourself, Dennis, Ange, um, yep, uh, Glennis, yep, Rosa, Jada, uh, Nick, uh, Sandra, yep, Phoebe and Daniel, yep, John and Kadira, John and Kadira, there's John, Kadira not with you, yep, uh, Michaela who's out the back listening, uh, and Pam, Pam. Um, We feel at the moment for many of you, there is a lot of uh, what I'd classify as sort of self-absorbed emotions, you know, where you're thinking a lot about your own life, day-to-day -day life and those kind of things, which is very good as a part of your self-reflection. But, but there's not a strong feeling inside of you of really desiring to love others. Now, interestingly, I know for yourself, Elvira, that you sort of feel like, why am I here, right? Yeah, okay. And I'll explain to you why you are, <laughs> if you like. Even though you often have a feeling of, um, you know, rage, which was very prevalent at the start of this group, there's also this feeling in you that we feel from, from you at times, and particularly uh, we feel it the last two days, where you do want to get better with love you know like you, there's this real strong feeling in you that you want to get better with love even though you know that you're not very good at it at this point does that make sense so while there might be others in the group who you feel are better at it than you are we actually feel this desire in you and and our uh, the this this chat today was all about trying to connect with your desire does that make sense yeah so you get that you're surprised about it, but you get that. Yeah. I, can I add, Elvira? Mary wants to add. I've always felt that from you. From the very first time I met you, I've yeah. always felt a feeling, I'm in the shit, but I want to love. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm a terrible person, but I want to love. <laughs> like, I'm going to learn for it. Be damned. <laughs> that kind of feeling, and that's a lovely feeling. It's a beautiful quality. Yeah. And we, we've met people in the hells with that feeling. And those people are much, much easier to help in the long run than people who already believe themselves to be quite developed. Okay, so now we need to talk to you about tomorrow. We have some question marks still about tomorrow. So perhaps what we need to do is talk to you about tomorrow, tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I'm thinking our best course of action tomorrow maybe is if all of you came in the morning and we would read, do the same as what we did today, and that is read out to you who we'd like to be there for the rest of the day, and then give those of you who are left over an opportunity to ask why. Does that sound all right? And that will help you help you um, engage maybe what's going on. And between now and then, if you have a good think about your relationship with God, do you really want one? You know, how, is it a is it a desire that you really want one or not? What what's your feeling about that? Does that make sense? Good eye. Okay. Well, now we're going to talk about. I'll just let myself uh, let myself get sorted here and get rid of some of this. Okay. Now we come to one of my favourite subjects. So. Yeah. All of the things that we've been presenting up to now have been. A, um, they've all been about, so I suppose what you would call natural love, developing the desire to to love within yourself. Does that make sense? So so you can't do that unless you develop your will. 
that you strengthen your will to love. You can't do that unless you do some things about your facade and you can't be loving until you get to your hurt and you actually process your way through some of the hurt and you can't um, do it unless you get through some of these addictions that you're facing. Does that make sense? You can't do those things. So what we would like to do, so up until now we've tried to encourage you to develop in natural love, basically. That's what we've been focusing on. Right? Now during that we've mentioned a little bit about God and a little bit about God's nature and, and a little bit about feelings of connecting to God. But, uh, but to be honest, we've fo tried to focus your attention on much more honest self-examination. And hopefully after the last four or five days you've now, you've now got a bit of a picture of how much more honest you're going to need to be with your self-examination. Does that make sense? Now, now we get to the subject, forgiveness and repentance. And this subject is very much about your relationship with God and very much to do with the, other, the aspect of equality of God's love. Because God wants to forgive you for everything you've done. And God would like to see you be sorry for everything you've done to other people. So this is very much a part of God's personality and nature. Does that make sense? These qualities of forgiveness and repentance are very much a, a, a factor of God's personality and nature. Once you engage these qualities, you will start to feel a lot of God's personality and nature as a result of engaging these qualities. But before we proceed, we need to explain to you what the forgiveness relationship is and what the repentance relationship is and how these two things are linked to each other so that you understand them. Does that make sense? So that's what we're going to do first. So let's draw a few people who have been influential in your life. Of course, there's usually mum or a dad, whether that's the absence of mum or dad or not. There's usually your mum or dad who have been influential in your life. So here's you. I'll just put you here. Then there's, as you were growing up, the influences of your life. Now, most of the growing up influences of your life who were adult are to do with Firstly, there's a group of people whom, unfortunately, in the Western world are mostly women so, who were teachers in your life. So you could say they were your school teachers. So this is mum, dad and mum. This is me. Now, for some of you, you had a situation where maybe your grandmother, grandfather, you know, some extended family lived in your household or had a very, very large uh, say in what, how you were brought up and treated. So let's put those people over here, some of, which we would call extended family. So there are many men and women who had a day, we're talking now about the ones who have a daily influence in your life. So not just once every three months you go and see grandma, and, but I'm talking about the ones you either lived with or you, you had some kind of daily influence in your life with. Does that make sense? Okay, now from the moment of conception, their emotions began to flow into you. The emotions from these groups of people. Now, from the moment of conception, the primary person who controlled what emotions flew, flowed into you was your mother. Because your mother has a soul that envelops her and that soul of hers has belief systems, belief structures and so forth. And those belief systems and belief structures determine what flows into you, into you as an individual. Does that make sense? From the time of conception to the time of birth, her ideas and concepts of life will severely co colour 
your ideas and concepts of life. So even if like dad has an emotion, for example, like if he has an emotion towards women of some kind, then it will only enter you if mum also has an agreement to that emotion. Does that make sense? And if dad has emotion uh, during this time of conception that we're talking about to birth, if dad has an emotion that mum disagrees with completely, then that emotion during this time of conception to birth probably won't enter you. Uh, it will begin to enter you after you're born. But it, it won't enter you because there's, there's a mother's soul is protecting what enters you. And the same applies to spirits. So any spirits who start connecting with you from the time of conception onward are completely determined by mum's belief systems and, mum, and what mum feels about spirits. Does that make sense? So if mum's completely open to spirits, like there's some people in other countries where the mother wants the child to be the next Buddha, for example, right? or the next, you know, next Dalai Lama, right? then, then the mother will be very, very open to spirit influence. And from the time of conception onwards, a lot of times these children are overcloaked by a spirit who then, by the time they're birth, who are already born, already has a large amount of control over that child's will and, and development. Does that make sense? So that's pretty sad that that happens, but that's what happens. Because of the holes, if you like, the, the, uh, the misunderstandings and the false belief systems of the mother. So we've got, firstly, the flow of, of if you like, the flow from the time of conception onwards of error from your mother entering your soul. And from the time of conception to birth, you have a flow of all these other parts of error, and we'll draw more because there are a lot more, because there's a lot more extended influences as well. There's extended environmental influences. So let's put these things out and call them the environment. Right? And in the environment, we have political power and whatever the dad and mum accept regarding politics. So we've got political power. We've got religious power and whatever the mum and dad accept about religion. So we've got religion. We've got economic power and whatever the mum and dad accept about economics. Huh? Right. We've got what you would call corporal power or authoritarian power and whatever mum and dad accept about authority. And so forth. We can add to that, can't we? Whatever mum and dad accept about medicine, whatever mum and dad accept about, you know, whatever, any, any area, entertainment even. Right? All is present in the environment. Okay? Now, they, these kind of things have severely affected mum and dad, have they not? So both mum and dad have got sp specific beliefs about those particular things that have entered them in their soul and they've now become a part of them emotionally. And so if mum's open to it and dad says, yeah, men, men are better than women and mum feels that men are better than women and I happen to be a man, I'm going to receive that via my mother during this time from conception of birth, the idea that I'm better than a woman. I'm a be it's better than I'm a boy being born than a girl. I'm going to receive that. So by the time I'm born, I'm already believing that. I've already got a feeling in me that that's true. Right? Or if mum said, if mum said that no, her beliefs are women are better than men, men are a bit, bit, bit stupid and and then she has those feelings of anger and rage towards men, and I'm a man, then my feelings are going to be very different about being a man, aren't they? I'm going to feel like, yeah, men are not as good as women, because that's what I've got mostly. And even if Dad thinks he's better than Mum, if Mum thinks she's better than Dad, then I probably won't feel, as a male here, that I'm better than women, because my Mum's feelings will dominate from the time of conception to birth. 
Okay. Now, if my extended family have, a, have an influence upon me right from the moment of conception in that they live in the same household as my mum and dad, or they have a daily influence over my mum and dad, then of course a lot of their belief systems will have entered me by the time I'm born as well. By the way, you can ask questions if you, if you want to through this. So, Anto, if we come down to Anto. Um, you talked about spirits. Where, let's say they're open to spirits. What happens if the mum's just fearful of spirits? Then that creates an openness yes, Still. to attacking spirits. Yeah. So, of course, that means that the child then becomes open to being attacked by spirits, just like his mum is. Yep. We go to Pierre and then across to Daniel. Wow. So, Jesus, do you mean that after we are born, any belief system that is in opposition to our mum belief system won't enter also? Well, no. From the moment of birth onwards, then it's a bit different. But from the moment of conception to the moment of birth, any belief system that is opposing our mothers probably will not enter us. It's only after the moment of birth. Now, if you think about that, if my mother's belief systems have entered me from, from conception to birth, then it also is going to create an opposition to other belief systems that are in opposition to my mother's after birth. Does that make sense? Because I'll already have the emotional belief. Yeah? Yep. That's what I, I, I meant. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that's what will happen between conception and birth. Yep. So if we come to um, Daniel, wasn't it? Who, who was here? It was just Pierre, then Daniel. Yep. Yeah, I was, so it's mostly adults that have that intense influence on us in our environment. So that what all these groups you've described. Yes. Are adults in a de you know, relatively damaged place. So I'm wondering about older siblings, for instance. Yes, uh, are, yeah, older adults. siblings do have some effect, but, but see, they've already been affected by the adults. Yeah. So, so the older siblings have already been, all of their emotional injuries are already from the adults in the system anyway. So the reality is the majority of even their emotions, if they're projected at younger siblings, are actually coming from the adult via them to the person. Yeah. So in reality, they have very little to do with the damage that's in you, uh, with, the, with one exception, and that is if one of, those, uh, one of those siblings were much older than you and they had a large input in your upbringing. Yeah. So in other words, if you had a sibling that was like 15 years older than you and she, her, her sister, and she was made to be responsible for most of your upbringing, then of course that is going to have a very large effect on you and in fact even a larger effect than your mother. Yeah. With one exception and that is your mother obviously from conception to birth has the most the effect, or the only effect on your soul. Yep. You. Come down and straight in front of you. Uh, Jesus, uh, could you please explain to me the emotions that enter the unborn child which result in miscarriage because my mother, before I was born, uh, she was pregnant and uh, there was a miscarriage before me. So yes. I was just wondering like, what that could be. Yes, uh, with miscarriages uh, there are a lot of emotions being projected from both mother and father but mostly passing through the mother towards the child. And many of these emotions range from all sorts. So your mother's specific emotions, I'd have to meet her to, to actually know what they are, but, but the, the emotions range from huge demands that the child meets certain specific needs in the mother or specific needs in the family that, that, that are then placed upon the child that the child feels and feels repelled by. Right? And this is one of the major causes of miscarriage. The child is being repelled unknowingly by the mother. Now, many mothers feel exactly the opposite emotion associated with miscarriage, which is an indication of the codependency that already is developed before the miscarriage even occurs. Okay. So many mothers feel like, I desperately want this child, I really want this child to stay there. I, you know, and that desperation is an addiction, and the child is feeling the addiction mm. rather than feeling that they're wanted, 
they feel the opposite, a repulsion to the desperate, addictive emotion. Okay. Yeah, and that's the cause of all miscarriages. Okay. Yeah. Now, because of these addictive emotions, there are sometimes additional things affecting miscarriages relating to uh, spirits overcloaking the child in the womb. And this causes a large problem with regard to the connection of the child's soul to the bodies in the womb. The spirit and material bodies are both in the womb at the same time, of course. And, and the spirits start to interfere with the energy passing from the soul of the child to the bodies. And that can also cause a miscarriage. But that is also controlled by mother's fear of spirits or, mother, or mother's desire for spirits to have a part in her life that she's not aware of and things like that. So the, everything is to do during that phase of con from conception to birth, every, a lot of the things that happen are all to do with the mother's emotions or her, the environment emotions that the mother agrees with. Yep. All right, now I don't want to have a long discussion about those kind of things here because we're not talking about those things, we're talking about repentance and forgiveness, right? But Car Ca Catherine. I just wondered what happened if your conception dad was there for conception and you had another father after that? Yes, well it depends upon your mother again as to what happens. What happens if the conception dad is there for the conception, obviously part of his emotions, you know, usually he's there for at least a few days, part of his emotions will enter the child and then if the other dad you know the one that the mum is not is lying to <laughs> usually under those circumstances is there for the rest of the time then the child will feel only those emotions that flow from that dad through the mother into the child does that make sense now the dad who was the conception dad obviously the same thing applies but my suggestion is that for most people, the conception dad under those circumstances is wanted more by the mother than the real dad from a sexual perspective. And so therefore, a lot of his emotions will possibly enter the child. Does that make sense? At, only during the time that he's around, uh, only if the mother agrees with them. Yeah. Any other? Kadira, thanks. Kadira, um, yeah, I have a question. It's really about repentance. Yeah. Um, as a mother, I. <laughs> Kadira, what I if we're going to discuss a lot about repentance and what's involved? So, perhaps if we can leave those questions okay. until we've discussed the the full, like what's involved with repentance, okay. shall we? Thank you. Does that sound alright? Yeah. Yep. Because we're, at this stage, we're just getting a bit of a grounding of where the damage comes from. So if we come down to Nick, and here if we come down to Jennifer. I just had a quick question about the emotions relating to premature birth. Yeah. Premature birth, again, is a very much affected by certain things going on for the mother, mostly, and, uh, and also any spirit interaction. Premature births, uh, often uh, people who... There's, there's emotions where the mother needs the child or wants the child to, so much to be present in its life um, or decides that, uh, that, you know, again, it can be completely opposite emotions. So in each situation, it's different emotions. And I, I don't know if I can go through every single permutation of the different emotions. But, but if we can just say it as a blanket statement, the emotions of the parents have a large bearing on what happens with regard to the gestation period and also the emotions that the child arrives in, you know, when it first arrives uh, through the birth. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm just trying to understand, and I just want a bit of clarity. My mother, her emotional self, um, I take on uh, from conception to birth. But I'm very aware that my mother was the submissive one in the relationship and my father was the dominant one. Right. So under those circumstances, what's going to happen? Your yeah. mum has an openness to all the domineering emotions of the male. Okay. So what's going to pass through to you? 
She's, what's going to pass through is dad's domineering emotions are already entering mum. She's got a complete openness to it. And so those domineering emotions are going to enter you to a large degree because your mum is completely open to them. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yep. Yes. Elvira? Now, I want to move on from this because there's a lot to discuss with you. This is the last... Um, I was prompted by the other question. In my husband's family, all the men are born early. Are born early, yes. Yes. So what's that? Well, again, I don't want to go into all these different emotional discussions, but obviously it's a lot to do with wanting the men to arrive early. And uh, if you think about the emotions involved with that, that's a lot about the women wanting men to rescue them, make them feel safe, make them feel secure, wanting them to be... But it's only the like the men on the men's side that are born early. So have I got something to do with that? Of course. The mother has the most to do with all this. I'll just leave you to think about that. So anyway, here's me, the, the child, you know. We've got by this, so we're now we've finished with conception, we're now at birth. We're now starting to receive Anybody with direct influence from anybody who, who is involved in our lives. Now, of course, our dad and our mum are the people, or extended family, are the people that are involved in our life the most, right? So, of course, they start having the greatest effect upon our soul. Does that make sense to everyone? They're having the greatest effect on our soul. That's where most of our injuries are going to come from. Or remember our facade gets created from conception and our hurt gets created from conception. So now these two things, the facade and the hurt, are being created. Initially they were created via my mother due to the way that God designed the system. And then, and then as soon as birth occurs, then any person who has a daily influence upon my life now has a daily influence upon how many injuries I imbibe. Okay. When I grow up a little bit more, in modern society, in Western society, sometimes by the age of two, I'm handed over for the majority of the day to childcare. So under those circumstances, so if I just put those in this category over here, childcare. From that time onwards, whenever I'm placed in childcare, some of those emotions start being influenced upon me but of course it depends now whether I have a predisposition for the many of those emotions to enter me or not and the predisposition was determined a lot of what happened during my conception to birth period does that make sense but now I have emotions entering me that come from childcare and school teachers as I'm growing and until I've developed, usually by the age of seven, I have a, de a fairly developed brain and a fairly developed awareness, not a complete developed awareness, of course, because a lot of our awareness really starts developing du during the teenage years. But I have a fairly well-developed awareness by this stage, and a lot of the damage that's been done to me by this stage has occurred from those groups of people. And their openness to whatever the environment imposes. So if the environment poses a political power of, of autocracy, but internally mum and dad disagree with it, then I'm not going to love autocracy. I'm going to be quite rebellious towards it, just like mum and dad were. So it just depends on my mum and dad's and extended family's response to the environment as to what injuries will enter me. Okay, now what I've drawn in red there... are the people we need to forgive. And if we refuse to forgive them, we will create a whole group of things we need to repent for. Now, for the majority of us, we have refused to forgive them. For the majority of us, we're taught to not forgive them. We're taught to agree with them. <laughs> right? And that's not about forgiving them for when they were out of harmony with love. So remember, every time they are now, this, any of these factors are now out of harmony with love, 
they are now impacting upon us negatively and therefore unlovingly. They are committing sins which affect us as an individual and create emotional, soul-based damage within ourselves. So every action mum takes that's out of harmony with love towards myself and every action I observe her taking out of harmony with love towards others will have an effect on what injuries enter me. And every action my father takes that are out of harmony with love towards himself, out of harmony with love towards my mum, out of harmony with love towards myself will be noticed by me and felt by me and that injury will enter me. Right? And every action my childcare workers took while they were bringing him up from the age of two or whatever it is, any action that my, mom, my grandparents ha had when they were involved in my life every day will always have this same effect upon my soul. And so I am accruing damage, hurt. Now at this stage I haven't got a developed will, a, form, a formally developed will. No, I don't really know what I'm doing with my life. Other people have much more strongly developed will than I do, even about my life. Mum and Dad are forcing me to do things I don't want to do. You know, my family environment forcing me to do things I don't want to do. So that's their will mostly that's now trying to overcome my own will. And rather than teaching me how to use my will, rather than teaching me how to love, rather than educating me, they're not. They are actually educating me the same way they've been educated, which usually is way out of harmony with love. And so now I have a whole group of people that I need to forgive for what they've done to me. If I want, because they created hurt in me, every time they did something to me out of harmony with love, every time they taught me something out of harmony with God's love, every time they taught me something out of harmony with God's truth, I imbibed an error, an error which I am going to need to let go of if I want a relationship with God, and also an error I need to let go of if I want a relationship with other people. So everyone's fine with that so far? Okay. So there's my forgiveness relationships. They are the people eventually I'm going to need to forgive if I ever want to become at one with God. Lani. Uh, that's an awful lot of error. It is an awful lot of error, I agree. Do we need to kind of remember or forgive every incident or just... A well, you have two options. One option is you go through every single thing that's done to you, one by one, and you forgive them, which is the natural love path. Another option is to actually receive God's forgiveness, in other words, to actually connect to God and work through issues and receive some of God's love through the connection. And you'll rapidly come across lots of things all at the same time. So one option is a slow change where you have to engage every single person in a process of forgiveness. The other one is a long, uh, is a much more rapid change, a much more intensely emotional experience, where you allow God to work on your soul with love, and therefore you find yourself becoming aware of all of these different things very, very rapidly. When it's not instant, though. There's no such thing as instant change. Give up the concept that there's instant change. There is no such thing. So if we come, yeah, and then across to, yeah. Hi, Jay, Mel. Um, so my question is about um, children that are adopted or fostered at that point. Yes. So well, you're saying that the mum and they would then have injuries towards the mother and father at conception and at birth. Correct. So okay. now if we've got an adopted yep. family, uh, original family and an adopted family, then obviously there is a man and a woman in the adopted family which will also have been having an impact upon the child. In the end, it's still parental-based injuries that need to be sorted out by the child at some point in its future. Thank you. Yep. Um, I've, got, I've got a question about, is it, is it possible at all that as a child that you knew that this was going on? Yeah. Well, when you say no, the, we need to be a bit careful here. Intellectually, there is very little knowledge at this point of what's going on. 
But there is a, quite a large amount of emotional experiences that the child is feeling distressed about during this period of time, which is the reason why children cry a lot. Right? And, and often children cry a lot once they are born because the emotions that they're getting projected from other people other than mother are very different to the mother's emotions being projected them while they're in, in the womb. Right? So there's often, a, there's often a discrepancy in emotions now once they're born in comparison to what they got from their mother in the womb. Right? So, so yes, there is a lot of distress in the child. But unfortunately for most, most of you will not have any intellectual cognizance of that distress. So in other words, you're going to need to go through some emotions in order to recognise the distress rather than having an intellectual awareness. Yeah. <sighs> I, I, I recall um, rejecting spirits, being afraid, and, and rejecting and hiding and trying to disengage and not acknowledge. Yeah, but at what age? I had no at, idea what. At what age, though? Oh, as far as I can remember. Yeah, but. Probably it, around three, four. Exactly. See, a lot of us don't have a developed memory before two or three. We don't, when our brain is developing very rapidly during this phase of our life from birth to, to that age. And in fact, by the time we're two or three, our brain generally is doubled or even further in size than it was when we were born. And for that reason, there's a lot of changes going on with us uh, from a terms of a memory perspective. But, and also during that phase, we're quite connected to guides. So you can have guides telling you about you know, what's gone on in your life, even at that age. But for the majority of people, there's not a large amount of intellectual awareness and this is why there's a large ignorance of it on the planet, because it's not a large... See, on the planet there's intellectual dominance without any intellectual awareness of the childhood damage. Whereas if we were emotionally dominant, you could see that we'd probably be more aware because we allow the emotions more. But because there's an intellectual dominance on the planet, what we finish up with is an intellectually dominant viewpoint of our childhood. And that's our parents' viewpoint of our childhood, which was that it was all great. You don't have to have anything to worry about. <laughs> right? And that's obviously not true. There's all these emotions that have flowed into the child. Yep. But as a child, we often know that there's something wrong with all this. Right? But, but we, don't, we don't really know what, because we don't have a developed intellect to know. Okay. Max, you, let's have the last question on this and we'll move forward. Uh, my son cried for the eight, first 18 months of his life every yep. night. Yep. And, uh, and I felt that it was because of uh, the rage that I had inside of me. For um... I don't want to get involved in this chat about your personal lives and your personal emotions and how they've affected your children. Does that make sense? I'm trying to teach some principles that we need to engage and understand. Um, and you know, while we can have these discussions, later at another time um, and there's questions that can be answered we need to first understand the principles before we can get engaged in like, understanding everything else yeah so let's do that shall we okay so there's our forgiveness relationships let's call them does that make sense they are the people in our lives that created causal emotional injuries to us in our lives and they caused us harm and at some point in our future we need to choose to forgive them and if we don't we will automatically create addictions to overcome the feelings of the harm automatically all your addictions are automatic creations because we've chosen to not forgive to not become aware of what's going on and forgive Okay, now let's just remind, remember that this environment influence is still there, but I need to rub it out because I need to just draw a few more things on this board. So we'll leave that blue environmental influence and we'll put that up here. Just to remind you that it's present. This person grows, develops. Their intellect develops emotionally. Of course, there's a lot of emotions already locked up at certain ages now because the child might have been at two, it cried, mum smacked it, 
let's say mum lost her lost her cool, lost her temper, smacked the child, the child now had violence associated with so-called love and we get all these distortions about love that has now occurred. So this child has now a lot of distortions about love in, inside of it. It doesn't know what love is because it's never really experienced it, sometimes it experiences it and then from the very person that experienced love it often experiences pain. And so it starts associating the fact that if somebody loves you, they also can cause you pain. There's now the openness and acceptance of pain in a loving relationship as a result of that. So there's all these distortions in love that get created during this childhood formulating years. And now the child is starting to become a teenager, right? starting to meet other people, starting to have its own life. So by the time it's going to school now, it's interacting with a lot more people. Right? That makes sense to everyone? Interacting with a lot more people. And then of course the child continues to grow, continues to develop, starts entering relationships. So it starts attracting another person. Let's say its attraction is heterosexual, so in other words it will attract a dominant woman into its life. When I say dominant, a woman with whom it, this now adult or teenager wants to have a relationship. Right. But the problem is that it's going to now start acting out many of its injuries about love. And because it hasn't forgiven, it's going to act out these injuries about love on the person that it's now attracted. Right? So now it proje it's projecting, if you like, or it has feelings towards that person that it thinks is loving or knows is not, it doesn't really matter, but, but the, that are unloving towards that person. That person now will feel them, it does damage to that person. This person will also have feelings towards themselves that you know the parents created through their injury that are completely out of harmony with love. In other words, they might think of themselves as being superior to everyone else. So that's an injury. Or they might feel themselves to be inferior to everyone else. That's another injury, different type of injury, but it's still an injury. And this person may attract a series of relationships during its teenage years. So there may be, even if we put them in the background here, a series of girls in this case, one after the other, um, who, with whom they have a relationship and they act out these injuries. So they are now damaging those people through their unhealed emotions. But eventually they'll find a person generally that is their dominant relationship, the, uh, whom we often refer to as the person they will marry and have children with. Although nowadays a lot of these people they have children with already, don't they? So they just meet them one night stand or a few months and they have a child with that one or meet another one, one night stand, a few months, a year, two years, have another child. And sometimes this person can finish up with three or four child children from different parents, from, different, from a different partner each time. And so of course from these can come children. So I'll just draw those children here. which are now damaged also by these different relationships. But this person here may not spend that much time with these children during that phase. It'll be their mothers that are mostly spending that time perhaps. But eventually they'll get married, they'll have children of their own. So here they have their dominant, their children. And all the things that they feel their partner does not fulfill in them, they will actually also develop these children to have a codependent relationship with them. But if the partner is a loving partner and they feel it's a loving relationship and all those kind of things, then um, they may not even do that, but all the damage that is still within them will be placed upon the children. And on top of that, this person has beliefs about the environment 
that are very distorted generally. They're, not, uh, they're out of harmony with love, very distorted. And so they project all of their belief systems and feelings also upon the environment. So, so let's uh, now place the environment down here, another environment if you like. Sometimes it's a completely different environment than the environment that the parents were brought up in. But they have all of these projections, if you like, or feelings about their environment, that they project at their environment. And of course the environment has all of these projections of them, but of course they're only going to accept the ones that generally mum and dad accepted. So the damage has been done by this environment. This, this, in this case, they do damage to their environment. <laughs> So all of the blue lines are where we need to repent. Now that's very interesting in itself. Because it's basically saying that when we have a problem with a partner, we are going to have to repent. When we have a problem with our children, it's something for which we will probably need to repent. Not the other way around. Our children will need to learn, or if they want a relationship with God, will need to learn to forgive us. Just like we need to learn to forgive those who did damage to us. Okay? So, Dennis. So, so does, do they work concurrently or can, like, do we, can we not repent until we're forgiven or which? It's a very good question you ask. The reality is the process of repentance requires that the process of forgiveness be engaged in order for repentance to be complete. But the process of forgiveness can be engaged before you've done anything to repent for. So it's actually better to engage the process of forgiveness as rapidly as you possibly can because it will prevent you from doing further damage to your environment. But we'll go through all of these principles as we talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So if we come down to Bruce. Yeah. Um, do you not have to seek forgiveness from the people you've injured along the way? Do you have to seek forgiveness from the people? Well, like yeah. The, 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 Let, know, let's hey. look at the forgiveness. When I say the forgiveness relationships, what I mean is these are the relationships that we're going to have to forgive yeah. ourselves. In other words, there's going to have to be a feeling from us to the person that we need to forgive them. Yep. Right? And the blue ones are the relationships where we are going to have to be sorry for what we've done. In other words, we'll be seeking their forgiveness, but you've got to be very careful about that feeling. Because many of you seek forgiveness, and when you don't get it, you get angry, which is actually not, it's not forgiveness you're seeking. It's a lack of responsibility you're seeking if you get angry. So we would not have to repent the um, relationships we've had. If you hold the, way. the... Something's a bit quiet about that, Mike, eh? Would we not have to give... Uh, repentance, whether we had children to them or not, the yes. relationships we had along the way. Yes, to a, to we will. We will have to repent towards these relationships we've had along the way because it's highly likely we've done something to damage them. Yep. However, the, there is highly likely inside of them a whole series of emotions that caused them to be attracted to you during the relationship for which they will have to repent towards you for. Does that make sense? So usually these relationships, they are relationships, so that means that the 
that this person has been attracted to this person for very similar reasons why this person has been attracted to that person. And for that reason, quite often, the damage that is done between the two people is not very large in comparison to the damage that was done from other locations. Thanks. All right. If we go to Peter. I was just wondering in relation to like the parents um, and un, like say once you're through, all the way through the uh, teenage years or you're, you're, an, you're an adult, you know, 17, 18, yeah. what about the unloving actions you then would choose to do out of your own free will, you know, towards your parents at that point? Do we repent for them? Well, or, of course, every single unloving action that we ever take will need to be repented for. Mm -hmm. However, the actions taken towards parents, if you think about it, are the direct response to that, the actions that the parents generally took towards us. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I was just wondering how that <laughs> So the worked. culpability of the problem with our parents is mostly still reliant on the parent. Right, okay. And the only exception to that is when we personally have chosen to harm the parent to deny the process of forgiving them. Okay. Yep. That makes sense. Thank so, you. So whenever we choose to not forgive our parents, it's highly likely at some point that we'll become angry with them. And once we become angry with them and we don't wish to forgive them, then we may take actions for which we will need to repent. Yep. But, it, but the parents have a large part in that action right from the beginning. Because yep. if, if they had gone through a process with their parents and everything of forgiving, then we wouldn't have even had that injury in the first place. Yep. So it's not a justification of our bad behaviour with our parents, but, but the reality is many times our parents do deserve the response they get more than any other person. Right? So in other words, many of you get angry with your partners, but you never get angry with your parents. Well, I suggest to you your parents deserve your anger more than the partner does. Right? And the reason why is because your pa parents did more damage to you than your partner did. So, so for most of us, we are actually detuning from the damage that was done by our parents. And we often blame our partner when actually our partner has very little part to play in the damage that's done. It's our parents that's primarily created that damage. Yep. Julie. I was just wondering... You're talking about families and everything like that and partners, but what about the repentance and the forgiveness of people that you have hurt on a day-to-day -day basis as well, you know, particularly when I'm reflecting back on... And maybe I, just, I don't really want to see the damage yes. I've done to partners in my life, but I'm also taking into, oh, my gosh... I've got so much repentance to take on. But they, they fit into this environment, environment that you've done. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're not people necessarily that have been involved in your day-to-day -day life. But if, let's say you're a male and you entered a position of power yeah. and, and then you decided to abuse that power, then obviously many thousands of people can be damaged by every single decision you make. Mm. So that, that, of course, every single one of those people at some point you will have to repent towards because of the damage you did out of harmony with love. So, so some people do far more damage to their environment than others. But for the majority, the average people on the planet, they do far more damage to their children than any other person. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's true. Thanks. Okay, Linda, down the front, and we come across to Daniel. Let's go to Linda, Linda first, yeah. Uh, AJ, I've only just recently even wanted to look at issues with my mum. Yep. And I'm, as I'm listening to this, I'm, I'm feeling that I, we have a very distant, disconnected relationship. So yeah. what I feel what I've been doing is withdrawing love, which is actually really quite an angry response to the way she's treated me, isn't it? It's a fairly normal response. Linda, to the way she's treated you. But it is angry. It's a, it's a way... And there are some times when you might disconnect from a parent, it, particularly even after you've forgiven them. Because if they continue to attempt to damage you after you've forgiven them, 
then then they they're not repentant for their actions and and you would just damage yourself further being around them so obviously there are times when you would continue to withdraw but but initially most people withdraw from parents because they don't want to become sensitive to the damage their parents have actually done so what i'm suggesting to you is that the reason why you've distanced yourself from your parents is because you know there's damage there but you just don't want to feel it and so distancing yourself from the relationship helps you not feel it so it's actually an avoidance of the pain rather than the connection to it that causes you to withdraw does that make sense yeah, it yep. does. But there. So the next question is, how do I get around that? And I, bet, I guess that will come later in the talk. Yeah, we need to talk about yeah. what do we do, don't we, to yeah. repent and forgive? That's obviously what I'm trying to do here. Remember, we haven't even got past the introduction yet. <laughs> what I'm trying to do here is to outline to you the very basic principles about repentance and forgiveness are all based around where did the damage come from. And what damage did you do? And most of us are totally confused about it. So, so when our son comes and talks to us about something he feels, we go, how dare you, you son, you need to, you know, you need to be repentant for what you've done to me. I've, I've brought you up, I've done all this for you and I've done all that for you. And actually the exact emotion you're feeling is more damage to that son. <laughs> and you're not, you wanting the son to repent when you should be the one who is repenting, right? Because the repentance relationships are the, towards the people you've harmed and you've harmed them the most. So when our son or daughter complains to us about some things, most parents go into ballistic mode when the, and, and actually do more damage when they don't, and they don't realise that actually that's a relationship for which I need to forgive, uh, sorry, repent for. To, I need to repent towards my children for what I've done to them. And then often we look at our parents and we go, yeah, my parent relationship, that was great, I had no problem there. You know? And then when the wife gets a bit narky with the husband, the husband goes, you need to be sorry for what you just done to me, not realising that actually he's a complaining because he's had a whole set of expectations set up by his mother. And actually because he hasn't forgiven her, he hasn't learnt about love on that subject and he's demanding all of these things from his wife that actually he, she doesn't need to repent for, she's just telling him the truth. And in fact the person he needs to forgive is his mother and he's refusing to forgive his mother and blaming his wife for his lack of refusal or his refusal to forgive the mother. See how complicated webs we weave. Right. Kadira, thanks. Oh, sorry, it was Daniel first. So. Sorry. Actually, you just covered what I wanted. I just wanted to acknowledge that I've got a huge <laughs> distortion about what it is to forgive and to repent because of injuries from my parents and what they... Yeah, told we're, we're going to go through what it is. Yeah, when they yep. force you to say sorry. Yep. So remember, we've still not covered a lot of information. We're just right at the beginning. Kadira, um, we also then, I presume, need to forgive ourselves. Like when we've repented for what we've done to our children... Is there a forgiveness element in ourselves for what we've done in that or not? Mm. Have a look at where the damage is. It do we need to our forgive parents. ourselves or do we need to repent? Well, we need to repent, yeah. yeah. But I, I've found that I've gone into self-blame um, a lot. Yeah, but it's not because you haven't forgiven yourself, it's because you haven't repented. See, this is where a lot of parents get things totally out of whack. A lot of parents believe that they need to forgive themselves for what they did to their children. No, you need to repent for what you've done to your children. And the process of repentance involves forgiveness of your parents, right. not of you. Thank you. <laughs> you're, doing, you're going to need to repent for what you've done for your, to your children. And that's going to be an emotional process. And a lot of people just mistake that emotional process completely. And, and in fact, you know what I hear a lot of parents going, oh, I need to forgive myself for what I did to my children. And they do that before they even repent for what they did to their children. Yes. And I see that's a major problem on this planet because those children are not yet feeling from you that you're sorry for what you did. And you're letting yourself off the hook before you've actually been sorry for what you did. 
I have had a discussion with my daughter. Um, yeah. in this a discussion regard. is no good, Kadira, well, to be frank. Honestly, a discussion yes. is no good. It's got to be a feeling from I, you. I do feel sorry. No, you don't. Oh, okay. You don't. Mm. Your daughter's still engaged in abuse of herself. Yes. Yeah. So you don't feel sorry yet. You will, but you don't yet. You've forgiven yourself prematurely. Okay. Does that make sense? And I need to show you what the process of repentance and forgiveness is to help you identify where you are in the process. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. So I'm not attacking you here. I'm just saying that most parents love the concept of prematurely forgiving themselves before they repent about what they've really done. Right? This is a very emotional process that you're going to go through with forgiveness and repentance. It's a completely different process than analysing everything. It's going to, and, and letting yourself off the hook prematurely is not going to help you go through the process. But I see most parents trying to let themselves off the hook prematurely and so their children continue with the same problems because there's no true repentance has taken place. Does that make sense? Thank you. So be yes. very careful as a parent that you get into this cycle of thinking you have to forgive yourself when the reality is you really need to repent first towards your children before you're ever going to forgive yourself. Okay. Now, you. forgiving someone is involved, but it's not yourself. It's what your parents did to you that caused you to take the action. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Yep. Can we come across to Kel? Is that nearly a, um, like a sin and a motion from the parents itself that we have to, us children, forgive them? Of course, like most parents have this attitude towards their children. I've, I've repented. I've been sorry. I've said I'm sorry. I've said I'm sorry. Yeah. Why are you getting angry with me still? See, that's a, that's a parent who hasn't, who hasn't repented. They've said they're sorry, but they haven't repented. It's only just a whole heap of words. Because when you're really sorry, you never get angry with the person you're sorry towards. You can totally understand. Even if they try to abuse you, you can totally understand why they've taken such behaviour because you created it. You, you, you wouldn't ever go, I said I'm sorry to your child. No. Right? You'd be going, okay, this is telling me. I'm probably not, you know, there's more here for me to work on. And even if you're totally repentant and God's completely forgiven you for everything you've done and your child is still attacking you, you, you will act very differently compared to a person who's like, who just believes a child should instantly forgive them as soon as they say they're sorry. You get that? This is a big problem between parents and children. We often say we're sorry, but we haven't gone through repentance. When, when we haven't gone through repentance... There is no sorrow really in the heart. And, that, and the child can feel that. The child knows that. The child's not stupid. <laughs> you know, it can feel those feelings. Yep. Okay. We come to Laura. Um, so if. Oh, sorry, Laura. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Um, getting, if... I'm getting to know everyone's names now. So. <laughs> If um, I can still forgive my parents, even if they haven't repented, though, can I? Like I don't. Can I suggest yeah. if you want to grow yourself or you want to get rid of any become loving, you're going to have to forgive them before they repent. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, if you don't, you will be waiting. Many of you for centuries. Yeah. You'll be waiting for centuries for them to repent before you forgive. Don't wait for another person to repent before you forgive. Ever, ever, ever. You're locking yourself up, consigning yourself to a very hard life if you do that. This is what I see many people doing. Many in the group that was previous to this that we had, many in the group are so angry and resentful because that's what they're doing. They're waiting for everyone around them to love them first before they become loving. And if you do that, you're going to create disaster for your life. You're just going to get darker and darker and darker and darker, attic upon unloving emotions. It, it, it's really important principle we need to understand. But let's go through some of the principles, shall we? Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Everyone understands the dynamics? Okay, well, let's start going through 
some of the things. How are we doing? You guys want a bit of a rest for five? Does everyone need a rest for five so that you can go to the toilet and stuff? Yep, let's do that for those of you who need that.